I'm Michael Hoffman. I'm a scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and I'm an assistant professor of medical biophysics and computer science at the University of Toronto. And today, I'm going to talk to you about gene regulation network analysis. So there are several objectives to this learning module. We're going to talk a lot today about transcription factor binding and how you can identify transcription factor binding sites with computational tools. And also, what are some of the, the things you can do using computational tools, and also one of the, some of the things you can't do. And we'll talk a little bit about using tools like, like GREAT, um, and then after, after this lecture, we'll have a um, lab where we will learn how to use Iregulon. So we won't actually learn how to, to use meme chip, even though that's what it says. We've replaced it with iRegulon because it is cytoscape based, uh, much like the other <coughs> other tools that you've been using during this this workshop so far. <coughs> so there are five different parts of this this lecture. So I'm going to give you an overview of the biology of transcription. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you can predict where transcription factor binding sites are, then how you can find novel examples of transcription factor motifs, how you can discover that, uh, and then how you can use chip-seq data along with transcription factor models to identify transcription factors that might be important for some, um, some process that you are interested in. So this will be directly anticipatory of the uh, lab that comes afterwards, which will be on combining that with, with gene regulatory networks of the type you've been using in the rest of this workshop. So, and of course, as always, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, so, first, introduction to eukaryotic trans transcription. So, how many of you, you here work on eukaryotes? Everyone? They're, they're bacterial or any, any bacterial or, or archaeal people? Yes? Okay. Well, we're going to talk, talk mainly about uh, transcription and eukaryotes here. So, um, you know, it's quite some of the same processes w work in bacteria, but it's, it's quite a bit more, quite a bit similar. Uh, sorry, quite a bit more simple. So, basically, transcription in, in the eukaryote. Um, if you really over oversimplify things, does this show up? Mouse, yes. Okay. So it involves a series of transcription factors, and each one of the transcription factors, or at least many of the transcription factors, are sequence specific, right? So here we have a transcription factor, this dark blue block, that is specific to the CAG GT. Uh, CAG, GGTA, you know, it seems to, to prefer binding to something that looks like that. Right? And it's a little bit degenerate in that you can probably change some of those, uh, those bases and its binding motif, and it'll still bind, but it might affect the binding energy, how well it binds, uh, how, how often it's actually bound versus going off into solution, and, and all of those things will affect these downstream effects. So this transcription factor, maybe along with other transcription factors, will recruit RNA polymerase 2. And then RNA polymerase 2 will go along the, the DNA and it will produce your RNA transcript. Okay, so this is kind of this, the simplest possible model for, for eukaryotic transcription. <clears throat> there are, in reality, it's a slightly more complicated. So let's add another layer of complexity here. So first, the parts around the transcription start site can be divided into different things, such as the core promoter, which usually has several different types of transcription factor binding sites. And there's usually, or often, a distal regulatory region that's not nearby the core promoter that has trans transcription factor binding sites as well. And sometimes those can also be downstream from the transcription start site. So they might be a distal regulatory region and an intron downstream within that same gene, 
or maybe even in a different gene altogether. Right? So all of this means that you, you can't just look at whether one transcription factor is binding. There are estimated to be, be between 1,400 and 2,000 transcription factors in, in humans. We have not even characterized all of them yet, so we don't even, you know, we, we might be off by several, several hundred. Uh, there's a lot we don't understand. They all, they all work together, but in reality, it's, it's a bit more complex even than what I just told you about before, because you have to consider the fact that eukaryotic DNA is organized in, in three dimensions. Okay, so not only do you have all of these proximal genes right here, uh, sorry, proximal transcription factor binding sites here, and you have the distal transcription factor binding sites. But the reason the distal transcription factor binding sites are able to affect transcription right here is because they, they aren't truly distal. In three dimensions, they're actually proximal. Okay, so they're right, they're right here, but there might be some big loop, some big, big chromatin looping that occurs that makes it look in... Uh, one dimension, like it's very very far away from the transcription start site it's activating, but um, in inside the actual nucleus, it's very close within three dimensions. But of course, whether that is close or far, that's something that can change. So the proximal promoter is always going to be right here, but you know if some more of this, to use a metaphor, string gets let out. Right, we might find that this this part is now uh, proximal to the the tra transcription start site instead. So speaking of strings, you, you know you might see that this is wrapped around all of these nucleosomes, and that's another thing that will affect whether certain transcription factor binding sites are active or not. So if a transcription factor binding site is Wrapped, wrapped around nucleosome, it might be inaccessible to some of these transcription factors. And some transcription factors are better than others at knocking away nucleosomes and being able to actually bind to things that were, that were previously bound by nucleosomes. And those are, those are called pioneer transcription factors. So, you know, we need, in order to accurately... Yes, go ahead. Can you just give an example of a what? Can you give an example of the... Uh, no, I, I can't. <laughs> so, and some people, you know, there's, there's often, uh, you know, dispute over the pioneer transcription factors exist, but that's, that's one model is, is, uh, that they do. CTCF probably, uh, works quite well. Um, so, you know, there are all of these different parts um, so having the sequence is, is not enough. Uh, if you want to understand how transcription is, you know, what sort of ingredients are there to allow transcription, you need to understand all of these other things about the structure of chromatin. Um, yes? Can distal enhancers be on another chromosome? So. I am not aware of any examples right now of that happening. Um, you know, there's there's one model that different parts of the you know that say within the human nucleus there are these so-called chromosomal territories where you'll find you know specific parts of multiple chromosomes always tending to be together in three dimensions, right? So there's probably some sort of regulatory effect there if, if that is in fact really happening. Um, but it's probably something people wouldn't refer to as an enhancer. So it's, a, it's another thing to remember about this is, you know, a lot of our understanding of the of 3D interactions of the genome are really, uh, you know, in their infancy right now. So we're just starting to get really good data on what the genome actually looks like in, in three dimensions. You know, what is consistent from cell to cell? What is what, what changes and what's noisy? So there are a lot of questions about how things work in three dimensions that that we don't know. So, so. Yeah, I'll just say I certainly could see that as a possibility, but to my knowledge, you know, no one has has directly shown that as a mechanism for gene regulation yet. Um, so, 
yeah, there are a lot of lot of ingredients to to um, that we can look at. So you know, one simply the RNA, right? So we're we're thinking about this as you know one part of of a fairly complicated machine, but you know, in the end, the way so I. I have a computational biology lab, and I, you know, focused on understanding transcription. And I think of it as, you know, you have a machine, DNA sequence comes in, and there are various other sorts of inputs, maybe in the form of transcription factors, maybe in the forms of epigenetic modification. And what comes out is RNA. So sometimes there'll be RNA expressed, transcribed here. Sometimes there won't. That's kind of the output of the, the transcriptional machinery. But it interacts with all of these other things like epigenetic marks, so histone modifications. Um, it, you can directly use ChIP-seq to look at where RNA polymerase II is occurring. You can look at where five prime ends of RNA are being produced so using a technique called CAGE. Uh, and that can be very important in understanding how transcription actually occurs. Because RNA-seq won't actually give you a picture of where transcription start sites are, it gives you a picture of where RNA is, right? So if you just try to infer where transcription start sites are from RNA-seq alone, you can be misled because there are things like exonucleases can come and eat away 5' prime end of your, your RNA-seq, uh, for example. So CAGE is a technique that looks for a 5' prime cap to an RNA and is supposed to tell you where the transcription start sites are. So these 1,400 to 2,000 different transcription factors I mentioned, you can figure out where many of those are using, using ChIP-seq. Um, ChIP-seq relies on having really high quality antibodies against your analyte. So often you cannot figure out uh, where things are with, with ChIP-seq because we don't have the, the high quality antibodies for that. Um, so, you know, there's a few hundred transcription factors out of the 1,400 to 2,000 that we have really good chip seek data on. Yes? So, you know, RNA-seq data, people, people can use it to quantify which, which genes are expressed and to a certain extent which transcripts are, are expressed. Um, so, you know, there's sufficient, like the data is going to cover the, you know, all of the exons, well, depending on how you do it, it'll cover up the whole gene, but, you know, exons of the transcripts that are actually expressed. Um, so you might be able to figure out you know, so I think you have a good idea for good idea of which genes will be expressed. You might have a good idea of which is the first axon if you're worried about alternate alternate sites. But something that I think is not often taught is that transcription start sites in um, eukaryotes often are not sharp at one particular position. Often there's a range of transcription start sites where the first axon can begin. So it might begin. You know, here it might begin 100 base pairs upstream, it might be in 50 base pairs downstream, um, and certain kinds of genes are more likely to have these, these sort of broad transcription start sites. And trying to figure out where, ex where exactly the TSS was, and therefore which, um, which transcription factor binding sites and epigenetic factors are causing transcription it's probably not going to be very easy just with RNA-seq data. So that's why, why people like cage data. OK, so we got, we got all this stuff around promoters, transcription factor binding sites. And if you want to figure out stuff about regulatory regions, um, we can, again, do ChIP-seq to look for epigenetic modifications. So there will be a different set of, of histone modifications that you'll find at enhancers. You'll also find things like enhancer RNA. So you can use RNA-seq to figure out, you know, if you do it the right way, to figure out uh, which, which regions are, are maybe driving enhancers and are not actually 
uh, driving gene transcription themselves. You can also look at, so they're co-activators, there are a number of, I might call them transcription factors, certainly proteins that um, are known to, to interact with distal enhancers. So the best, best known of these is P300, or the EP300 gene, which is you know, it's 300 kilodaltons. It's this huge scaffold that will allow lots of different transcription factors to kind of interact together in the same, in the same region. Right, so that's, that, that is often referred to as a transcriptional co-activator. So, yes? <clears throat> yes, I can, I can do that. Um, so, I don't, I don't have any slides on it, though. Can, Anne, can I erase some of this stuff, or is there, is there a good place for me to do this on the report? So, I had to pick the one with the banner, right? That makes it easier. Okay, so we'll just consider this line as a piece of double-stranded DNA. We'll make it simple. We know it's all it's all tied up in, in nucleosomes and compacted, but we'll just we'll just keep it simple. So let's say there's some protein of that we are interested in, let's say for example here it's a transcription factor, right? And we want to know where are the locations of that protein. So what we do in ChIP-seq is we, we take ourselves and we add something like formalin to do some cross-linking, okay? So we make the all the proteins stick very well to the DNA, right? So they're now chemically modified, so they're, they're stuck in there. And then we will do, what's that? We'll do sonication, or we'll do something. You can do other things like MNAS digestion. So we'll chop up the DNA into, into bits, all right? So you might try to get bits of DNA, there are 200, 300 base pairs in length. All right, and then we have some antibody that's specific against our, um, our analyte, our protein of interest, or histone modification, or, or something. All right, and maybe there's some, like, some off-target effect right there. Maybe it doesn't work so well, so it doesn't bind to this one. And then you do an immunoprecipitation pull down. So that's the, you know, CHIP means chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing. So after doing your immunoprecipitation, then you decrosslink, okay? You purify the DNA. Okay, so you're left with these pieces of, of DNA, and then you sequence. So we'll sequence, we'll get these ends, we'll get these ends, we'll get this. This is a very strange thing. Um, and then that might get ignored during your processing because it doesn't really look like how we, we expect it to. Um, and the other stuff, you'll have done this on probably with traditional ChIP-seq protocols, um, hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions of cells. So every, every place that there's actually a consistent transcription factor or mark, you'll get kind of a pileup of reads. On one side or the other, right? So then you can, you'll get something that looks like this, depending on which side you're on. And then you can use tools. There are a lot of different computational tools, like Max, that you can use to combine these two sides and then get back an idea of where your original analyte was.
So that's that's how ChimpSeq works. Any questions about that? Yes. The what? What's the strange thing at the end? This this thing? No, what you said on top. This? Yeah. Oh, that was just somewhere where you know this. So this is an imperfect protocol, right? So this is somewhere where you got a piece of DNA through the um, through the process that didn't actually have your analyte bound to it. So it's a little bit of noise. But since you did this on hundreds of thousands of cells, you only get like one of those instead or instead of um, you know, thousands of it. Also, it's really short, right? So these other things, like you expect this peak to be, you know, that distance from this peak, and you won't find it for that little piece of noise. Yeah, it's an artifact. Yeah, yeah. So it's not. No, it's 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 an artifact that will come out of the biochemistry, but it will be processed away during during computation. So, chip seek that gives us a a good segue into the next next part of this, which is mentioning places where you can get this sort of data. So there's um, a fair amount of chip seek data, especially for for humans, mice, Drosophila, worm. Uh, you know, people are starting to make more for various model and non-model organisms. Um, you can find a lot of the the human and mouse data. Human mouse, I guess some of the fly and worm data also at the ENCODE project, ENCODEproject.org. So they have done thousands of experiments, many of them chip seek on various transcription factors and lots of different cell types. So that's another thing to consider is that you know the part, you know, if you have a human, like which transcription factors and histone marks are found. Um, in liver cells is going to be very different from, say, brain cells, and that can be very important in figuring out how transcription factors interact. Um, roadmap epigenomics also has a fair amount of ChIP-seq data, mainly focused on histone modifications. Uh, you know, and there are other things like UCC Genome Browser has has a lot of different um, interesting data sets to look at. Uh, a lot of these are in sort of the regulation category if you're looking at a human or, or mouse mouse genome browsers. So that's sort of data that you can get on transcription. Yes? You're always looking at the total complement of transcription factors. Well, I, I don't know. So, wait, what, what do you mean? Well, um, you take your cell in a particular condition and then you do the chip seek analysis. Yeah, but but you're only doing chip seek for one at one at a time. That's for one transcription factor at a time. Yeah, yeah. How? How? Well, you've got the the antibody for one transcription oh, okay. factor. Yeah, so you can only look at you can only look at one at a time. I mean, you can look at which pro like if you use something like mass spec. You can look at which all the proteins that are in the cell, but it won't tell you where they are, right? Yeah. Well, gives you the so you, you got to choose between figuring out, at least for right now, you got to choose between figuring out the totality of all of the transcription factors and epigenetic modifications somewhere, and figuring out you know where within the three billion positions in a um, mammalian genome you you might find it. Yes. Yeah, I think we'll 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 get to to some of that later, later on. Uh, but I'm just kind of setting the stage for sort of the, the biology and the sort of data that, that we can get. So we'll we'll move on to the to the models unless there are other other questions at this point. So yeah, so that's exactly the the next question is how do we figure out where transcription factor binding sites are? You know, how do we do it? With some of this data, how do we do it? Maybe without some of that data, and use use some of that data as as sort of validation. Okay, so let's look at a transcription factor. As I mentioned earlier, transcription factor binding sites are degenerate. So you might find, say, a transcription factor. Maybe you find somehow, whether it's by chip seek or chip PCR or something, that it. Um, 
binds to this single site that has A, G, T, T, A, A, T, G, A. All right. You're also probably going to find it binding to a lot of other things that are similar. So you can see here, like we have a set of lots of different binding sites for this one transcription factors. And you can see a lot of similarities. This core AGT, TAAT is usually there, but sometimes this first symbol is A or C or G. And you know, some of the other things change, change a little. Um, so you can represent that as a consensus sequence. So many of you have probably seen R used as an abbreviation for A or G. Who, who has seen that? You guys, you've all seen that. You know, or Y means uh, uh, C or T. All right. So there's a there's a whole like other alphabet for every possible combination of A, C, G, or T. All right. So like. V means A, C, or G, um, D means A, G, or T, R, as we discussed, means A or G, and, and so on. So you can represent all of the parts that are, are variable here. Um, so for example, you know that this fourth position, if you look in all of these, it's always T, right? But this position before it might be G or A, and this position before it might be A, a C, or G. But there's something that we're we're missing here. So this this is not you know this is a very compact representation, but it eliminates some of the information we have, which is that when you have these degenerate positions, the um, frequency is not distributed identically, right? So if you look at this first position and count up how often you see different symbols, you see a fourteen times, and c three and g four times. All right? So it's not really a good model to just say this is V, meaning A, C, or G. All right? So you want something a little more complex. Um, and so people go to um, this sort of sequence logo representation, where you will have a bunch of columns, one for each position within the, the motif. And at each column, you'll see all four symbols, A, C, G, and T, where the height indicates how often that is actually found in your, your known motifs. Right? So this, this case where we have column four, where it's T 100% of the time, that's the highest, highest value here in the sequence logo. And here on the third position, you can see the G is relatively frequent more common than the A here and the C and T are relatively uncommon. So I think you know this sequence logo, which which you've probably seen many times in papers, even if you know, I find almost everyone has seen them, even if they don't, you know, really, you know, understand the mathematics behind them, because it's a great it's a great visualization of this. I think it's really intuitively uh, good to understand. But we're going to talk a little bit about what it means under the hood. <laughs> so I'll mention this, this equation is a, is a little messed up here, but it is, I checked and it is correct and correct in your, your printouts. So you can look there if, if you get confused at any point. So what we, ha what we have from simply the set of binding sites, we can start counting up the number of times we see each, each symbol, A, C, or G, T, A, C, G, or T, in each column here. All right, and that gives us something that we call a position frequency matrix. All right, so we might have, we're going to simplify slightly here, um, a uh, set of binding sites, so five binding sites, and we always find A in the first, first position, and then maybe we, in the second position we find C two times and G three times, and the third position is kind of a mix-up of various things. The fourth position is C four times, T one time, and so on. And so you can represent the number of times you see each, each symbol in each position as, as this matrix. All right. Starting from that observation, we can then convert the matrix into something that is, that is a better model for actually searching things across, across the genome. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to take this, this frequency, so we'll call this F, B, comma, I. Okay, so F means frequency, B means base, A, C, G, or T, and I means the column. Okay, so 
So this, this right here is FC3, because it's the third position for symbol C. All right, so we have that value. All right, and, and one thing that we can do is we can um, divide by the overall frequency of that particular base in the genome. Because right, we want to figure out, we want to convert this from something that describes how often we've found this, this particular base in a set of input sequences to something that tells us how surprised we are to see this base in a genome. So essentially we need a, we need a background model. And if you have, say, a CG-rich motif and you're looking for it in a CG-rich genome, like that that's not going to be very very surprising. If it, you're looking for it in a genome that is very AT rich, right, that is going to be a little more surprising. So by dividing by the uh, background frequency of that base, and the simplest way to do it is just to take the, the, number, uh, the number of times you see that base in the genome, divide it by the number of bases in the genome overall, you can kind of get an ex estimate of how surprised you are as well. And then one other thing you can do is you can add this this SN. So that will that is essentially a way of weighting how how many observations you have. Okay, so this SN is something called a pseudo count, and often we'll just add one to everything, right? So you add, so so basically we only have five observations. We don't want to set up a model that has a zero right here and says this can never be T based on only five observations, right? So we'll just add one to everything. So instead, this will be six, one, 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 all right? And this, this, this change from the pseudo count is going to scale based on how many observations you have, right? So if your position frequency matrix had 100 observations in it, adding that one pseudo count isn't going to change things very much. So it essentially kind of flattens out the distribution a little. And then the final thing that you do is you take the log of, of all of this, okay, and that makes the arithmetic a lot easier. It's a lot, it's a lot faster, you know, I and mean, you probably think your computers are pretty fast at, at arithmetic in general. Well, they are actually a lot faster at adding than they are at multiplying, just like you would be if you, if, you know, you were to do things, um, and especially then dividing, if you were to do things out longhand with big long strings of numbers. Um, and they're also more reliable that way. Okay, so sometimes people will use these tools and they'll get p-values of like 10 to the minus, minus 2,000 or something, which is a number that you can't even usually represent um, in the, the sorts of numeric systems you usually use. And people say, how is this even possible? Well, you, if you do it all in log space, it is, it is quite easily possible. So here is an example of a position-specific scoring matrix, or as, as People will often call it a position weight matrix. They're kind of two different names for the same thing that you get from this position frequency matrix. All right? And so one thing you can see is that this five has a, a positive score here, 1.6, right? and it's minus 1.7 for seeing any of the other things that you saw, you saw zero. And you can see here how we might use this position specific scoring matrix to score a particular sequence for this motif as represented here. So if we want to test TGCTG, we can simply look at each column within the position-specific scoring matrix we've made and add up the numbers. Okay, so we have a T here that's minus 1.7, plus 1.0, plus 0.5, minus 0.2, plus 1.3. You get a total of, of 0.9. Does that make sense? Yes. So you, there's only there's only one thing that that matches. So so this is after we've already created. So we have a discovery set, right? And we've created this position weight matrix based on it, and then that's fixed. And now we're applying a new sequence to it and saying, does this sequence match this motif that we've already discovered? Yes or no? So there's only one way to do this because we don't we don't look at the the highest score. This only fits in one place because this is exactly the same length as the as the motif. This is five five across, and so is this. Yeah, 
but it's um, on the P that's M on the right hand side, you will label T. Well, this is this is T. So this is the the sequence that we're testing against the motif, right? Okay, okay. So in the fourth column of this, this is T. So so that's what we have to do. <clears throat> so, yes. You're testing, you're testing the sequence against, against the motif. It's a new sequence, yes. So you had a bunch of sequences that you know are, say, bound by by MIC, right? For, for example, one transcription factor. You create this motif. I give you a new sequence, ask you the question, is this sequence bound by MIC, yes or no? And so you use this model that you've created from your previous observations to test the new sequence that is unknown by names for you. If you read the left side matrix, yeah. you would read it as the sequence of It doesn't. It doesn't become this. So this becomes this, right? But the the TG the the TGCTG is not part of your model. Okay. So so this is your initial model. You convert it to this model, right? And then you test this new sequence against your model. So this this does not convert it to this. You test this T against this. And as you can see in the first column, you get minus one point seven. So having that T there really hurts you. It says, you know, this T does not fit this model very well at all because the, you know, should be an A here. Well, the zeros in column one are minuses in the right hand matrix. Yeah, so that's that's basically, you know, you take the z zero, we added a pseudo count, we divide by something, right? So basically, so we we'll divide by the base frequency, right? So you imagine, let's imagine a genome where the bases are distributed equally, there's 25% frequency for everything. Um, you know, you get a, a, very, a, a fraction here, and you take the log of that fraction, and you get a negative number, right? So whether this is positive or negative tells you whether the, the prop, you know, whether you have something that's greater or, or less than one in log space. Okay. All right, so that's, so this is for the case, and this, this might make it, this next slide might make it a little clearer where you have one um, sequence, you know, it's exactly the same length of the uh, motif, and you're going to test that. And I'll show you how to do it for a much bigger sequence in a second. Yes? Yeah. Well, that's a you know it might it might have made a, a simpler example to do it with uh, with with ten base pairs here as well. So you know sometimes you try to expand things on either side so that you make sure you get every informative base of the motif. Uh, but I, it's 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 not a really important is, detail. But good good eye. Is there a fixed length or it's That is an interesting question that I think we will we will address a little more later in the, the lecture. And if it's uh, not answered for you, we can we can come back to it. All right. Other questions on on this? Okay. So we had a we had there a sequence that was the exact same length of as the motif. Let's look at something more realistic where we are going to have a big long sequence and we want to scan it for this motif instead. All right. Basically what you can do is you can do a, a sliding window approach. So if our motif, here's a SP1 motif from the Jasper database. All right. So this is 10 columns wide. All right. And what we do is we take a um, 10, 10 base pair wide window and go along the sequence, and we score each 10, 10 base pair window just like I showed you for the five, five base pair motif in the previous column. Okay, so you can see here, for example, this third column has a really big value for G, all right, and you can see here that it's a really high score, 2.1222, if you get a G in the, in the third column, you know, similar if you get it in the fourth column, and so on, and you can sum up all of this for this little window, and you get 13.4.
Okay, so that's that's your your absolute score for this. That's not you don't want to necessarily consider that in a vacuum for this um, for you know this particular motif because again a lot of this is about how surprised you are to see certain things. Right? So different motifs will have different possible maximum and minimum scores. And so, for example, here, the maximum score would be from something like G, 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 C, G, 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 T. Right? And you, what you want to do is you want to see how does this absolute raw score fit in with the max score, which here would be 15.2 for the best possible sequence and the minimum score, which would be minus 10.3 for the worst possible sequence to that motif. All right, so subtract the absolute score from the minimum score, divide it by, by the range, all right, and you get some fractions. So you get a relative score of 0.93 here, and the relative score will vary between 0 and 1.0, all right, or 0 and 100%, same, same thing. Um, and then, once you have this relative score, you can compare it against every other relative score that you calculate for every 10 base pair window in the genome. Right? So you can plot what is essentially a histogram of all of those scores, right? and you'll find that you know, the mode is about 0.2 or something, um, and then you know, your, your score right here, um, the score of 0.93, doesn't really correspond to the axis right here. You know, starts looking starts looking pretty good, right? And then you can even turn that into an empirical p-value just by looking at how likely any point in the genome is to be better than this this relative score than 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 worse than. Yes. Yeah. You do, you do a sliding window approach. So you, so you start here, and then you move over one, and then do this 10 base pairs. And then you move over one, and do this 10 base pairs. So that tells you whether you got that binds SP1 by chance. But you have an SP1 binding set by chance. Well, I don't know whether, I mean, you know, essentially, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to define exactly what is, you know, by chance and what, what isn't. You know, essentially, this is just looking at, you know, what your score is, right, and, and essentially, you know, how often do you find a score that is that high or higher, right? So we don't actually know for this, um, you know, whether these are real binding sites or not. We just know how, where it fits in the score distribution. And that's what the, the p-value is, is based entirely on, on that. Um, okay, so um, you know things like this SP1, this SP1 matrix. I mentioned it's from the Jasper Jasper database. Right? Jasper is a database of transcription factor uh, binding profiles, sequence logos, motif motif files that are equivalent to them, and the references. So it's all curate, curated by humans from the literature. So people, you know, include the reference of you know, where this, this motif came from. There are a number of these motif databases. If you look in the iRegulon paper, so the paper describing the, the tool we're going to do in the lab, there's a big table of different, um, different databases for it. I would recommend, in general, using this one if you need to choose, because it's, it's very well curated. Some of the other ones are you know, in my estimation, not as well curated or, or kind of defined in more dubious ways. Um, so it's what I usually, people in my lab usually use in our own research and so on. So how well do these models, so, you know, the question was, you know, is this, is this a score that's good by chance? How well do they actually perform in reality, All right? So in some sense, uh, pretty good. So... Um, you know, there's a paper in 1997 where they did some in vitro um, assays to see whether transcription factor binding sites identified with position weight matrix models uh, or position specific scoring 
matrix models, those things are synonymous again, um, you know, performed and found that 96% of the predicted sites um, showed up as true HNF1 <coughs> binding sites in their, in their biochemical assay. All right. And Gary Stormo and, and Fields found and that the best position of mate, mate matrices produce scores that are highly correlated with binding energy between the um, transcription factor and a piece of DNA. All right. So that's good. So at, at some approximation, the positional matrix is a good, uh, just good biophysical model. To some approximation, it is it is not. So he, the most obvious uh, problem is that you find uh, lots and lots of things that look like good binding sites. All right. So maybe you know, <clears throat> maybe you take such a, a p value uh, as your your threshold for this of uh, say point. Um, I don't know. One, one over, you know, say one over 500, like they lay, they have here, All right? So that would be a p-value of what, 0. 0.0002, um, or 0. 0.002, excuse me, right? So that seems pretty low, right? But that means that you're going to have a binding site every 500 base pairs on average, right? And the genome is big because there are three billion base pairs in the human genome. Other genomes, eukaryotic genomes, are often similar sizes. This is not really that useful to people necessarily, and also one might question whether it actually describes what's happening in reality, right? If you look at that chip seek data, it does not necessarily show binding every 500 base pairs, right? You can look at, say, this is something that was done uh, a while ago, uh, human alpha actin gene. So here's the gene model. Here are the um, exons, red boxes, here are all the transcription factor binding sites that are predicted from, say, several hundred transcription factor binding site models, several hundred motifs, right? Binding sites all over the place. This doesn't, like, you know, to some extent, this, this might represent biological reality, right? So, you know, it's certainly, there's certainly going to be transcription factor binding sites all over the place, right? Are they going to be as much over the place as you see here in this particular diagram? I, I would say no, based on, on what I've seen from ChIP-seq data. Um, and even if it were, it's not something, you know, if it just binds all over the place like this, it does not give you any sort of useful information. Right? So then we arrive at something that, that Wyeth Wasserman once termed the, the futility conjecture, um, which is that these predictions are almost always wrong. If you just go based on, on sequence, right, you will get a bunch of predictions and like your true positive rate will be really good. So you'll, you'll get almost all of the true predictions and you'll also get a ridiculous number of false positive predictions. So I remember when I was in grad school, I read a paper that he wrote on this and I, I said, this is really cool. I think I want to move into this field, which shows you how good my judgment is. But um, I think I was I think I was kind of lucky in that I moved into it at that point. But we can we can talk about that during the during the break. So what's more, there's a bigger problem. You know, you might say, okay, your you know your model gives you a bunch of false positives. Just increase the stringency of the model, right? So you get too many things when you have a cutoff of 0.02, set the cutoff to 10 to the minus 6. Cut the cutoff to 10 to the minus 20, right? Do your p-value cutoff there. Unfortunately, that doesn't help, okay? Because really, like, it is possible for the transcription factor to bind, and in vitro, it will bind for anything above some certain threshold, right? So, you know, your 0.002 threshold might be good enough in vitro, which is what this model is based on. But as I discussed in the introduction, there's a lot of other stuff going on, right? You don't just have one protein and one piece of naked DNA. The DNA is in, is in chromatin. The chromatin is, you know, the DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes. The nucleosomes have 
histone modifications that interfere with things. There are the DNA methylation that interferes with things. 3D genome organization interferes with things. There's cooperation between different transcription factors. Right? Sometimes if you get two of them together, they'll bind to a sequence, and otherwise they won't have the energy to do it. There's competition between transcription factors. So there's all sorts of other things that are going on, and this is, you know, not enough. So I will say that is that, that I don't want to disclaim this too much. It's still a, a useful model if you can kind of set the stage somehow and, and know that this is a region where transcription factor binding is likely to occur, this model will work. But you know, you can't just use it by itself on a, a string of in vivo DNA. All right, I'll sum up this, this second part of the lecture. So first, position-specific scoring matrices or position weight matrices accurately reflect in vitro binding properties of DNA binding proteins. But in vivo, there are a lot of other things going on um, that we have to model. So back to our, our couple of bacterial friends here. This works a lot better in bacteria because a lot of those things that we talked about going on in eukaryotes don't happen in, bac in bacteria, so it works a lot better there. Any questions on the, the second part of the lecture? Yes? You talked about statistic stringency. Can you distinguish the biochemical stringency? Well, so one thing about this, this model, um, you know, like we, there are a number of, of different ways to kind of represent the model and kind of here I've kind of represented an information theory, information theoretic kind of way, right? And there's a bio, biophysical model that is essentially equivalent to this, right? So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of different sort of frameworks, information theory, biophysics, statistics that you can use to understand the, the model, but essentially the basic model is equivalent in every case. So you can't you know, there's not really anything you can you can tweak there just with this sort of model. But you can add in other things. Well, because I think it, it's not that you're picking up thoughts from the biochemistry. Mm -mm. No. It's, yeah, it's because there are a lot of um, entities within, like, this is, this is a model of the interaction between one entity, protein, and another entity, a DNA double helix, right? But in the cell, there are a lot more entities that you have to contend with. So 1,400 other transcription factors that are interacting with your transcription factor, maybe competing with it, maybe cooperating with it, right? The fact that the DNA double helix is not just something that looks like this, it will curve around Right? It will actually be, there are actually several different axes in which it can change. Like, it can be tighter in some places. It can twist this direction or twist this direction or kind of twist this way or this way. And those things can all be affected by other transcription factors upstream or downstream. So you could have a much more complex biophysical model, and people are working on that. And uh, But, you know, it's kind of work that's that's not done, done yet. Um, and I'm not sure it'll be enough. Like, you know, I think there are, the, the fact of the matter is there are thousands of entities within the cell. So you need, if you really want a good model of this, you'll need something that's a lot more complex than just a two entity model. Other questions on this part? No? Okay. So, all right, now, now that I've told you how you can construct a model of transcription factor binding sites, um, and how, in practice, that doesn't work. I'm going to tell you how to use it further, this model that I just told you it didn't work. But I think <clears throat> you might say, why are you doing this if this model doesn't work? So here I'll, I'll reiterate the point that the model, in the right conditions, it works really well. Right? It's just you need to have some sort of prior knowledge about, about a region, some prior knowledge where you know that that region might be important for transcription in order for this to work. So when I showed you how we make position fre ma frequency matrices, and then from those position weight matrices, um, we had a really nice um, set of input sequences. Right? So they were all they were all 10 base pair sequences. 
and they all aligned perfectly, right? In reality, no matter uh, what what method you're going to use to generate your motifs, it's never going to be that easy, right? So in general, you aren't trying to discover motifs across the full width of your input. You're going to have some longer input, whether it came from chip seq data or protein binding microarrays or CLEX, um, and you will have to discover the motifs within within those sequences. All right, so here is an example where I have three sequences. They're about 750 base pairs, base pairs long, right? And I know for somewhat, somehow I know that they're all regulated by the same transcription factor. It all binds to all of these sequences, but I don't know exactly where within that 800, right? So our problem, the task here, is given these sequences, you want to be able to find the subsequences, these short little red sequences, that give you the best motif. Okay, so we can describe this in a little more a little more detail. Right? So, given a family or sequence or a family of sequences, you want to find um, you know, a number of motifs. You want to find the width of the motif. That may not be. That could be preset or maybe not. You want to find um, where the motifs occur. Right. So why, why is this difficult? So the input sequences are, are long. Um, if you do some nice in vitro assay, you can get it down to something fairly short. But if you're doing something like ChIP-seq, you're going to have lots and lots of long sequences to look at. And also these motifs, you know, as mentioned before, they're, they're degenerate. So it's not as easy as just you know, looking for, you know, 10, 10 symbol sequence like you would if you were like searching through a Word document or on your computer because things are are um, things are not exact, right? And then you have to figure out how much how much inexactness are you you going to put up with in terms of what you'll actually describe as a motif, right? And in some columns of the motif it might be very similar, and some it will be very unsimilar. So here. In other words, is an is an is an example of how we might do this. So let's say we are we know that a set of genes are co-regulated, right? And we are given a set of promoters from those genes, right? So we've already identified these genes from say RNA seq or microarray or something. We know they're regulated together. We don't have any chip seq data though, and then we decide to look in their core promoter, so we just use Galaxy and take 2,000 base pairs upstream of, of each of these genes, all right? And we think that there is some transcription factor that is responsible for uh, causing this co-regulation, right? And it binds to some position within these sequences, but we don't know where. And here's one more thing you have to worry about is you know, we we look at these things in these sequences, you know, ACGT, ACGT, right? But um, to the to the machinery within the cell, right? They don't see it as a one dimensional thing. They can see both strands of the DNA, and it looks the same to them, right? So we have to find things on either DNA strand, right? So here, here are the actual examples of the transcription factor binding site. Uh, for this transcription factor. So you can see here are some examples AAGA on this strand. Right here you find some examples TTCACTCAGT over here. That's essentially the answer is those locations. But you know, remember we don't have that. We just have these, these promoters. Right? So we want to be able to discover a position specific scoring matrix but we don't have that. We don't have the locations. We just have the big sequences, and we have to discover the sites. And then once we've discovered the sites, it's relatively easy to add them up and create a position frequency matrix like before. Right. So, the way any questions about this this problem before I, before I give you the answer? Unless you like spoilers and you've already read the answer and the, the stuff they've provided so neatly for you. Okay. 
so we're going to use something that we we often do in um, machine learning, which is called an alter, alternating approach. Right. So the search space is so huge, we cannot possibly try every every combination. Right. So like there are thousand starting you know, thousand positions in uh, one promoter, you know, we wanted to combine that with the next one, and the next one would be, you know, multiplying things times a thousand each time, and, and you know, pretty soon you run out of uh, atoms in the universe to which, which you do this. So instead, we do what is called an alternating approach, and thus we'll use it here, and it's often used in a lot of other machine learning problems where you're trying to estimate parameters, right? So what we do is we start with some initial weight matrix, right? And we do that simply by guessing. We just randomly come up with an initial weight matrix. You might do it uniformly. You might have some sort of prior knowledge that, that helps you find one that might kind of be good, right? And then we'll use that weight matrix to predict instances within the input sequence. So that scoring approach, I showed you how, before how you can scan a sequence and look for uh, the score of a, a weight matrix versus a sequence, we're going to do that against all of these sequences using the weight matrix that we generated randomly. All right? So we'll do that. We'll look for the best score, the best scoring position, and we'll stop there. All right? And we'll do that for all the other sequences. So then we have these different sequences that have been picked by, by our method. And then we will calculate a new weight matrix from those, and then we'll repeat this this process over and over again. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a diagram to show how this works in detail. Do you have a, Do you want to see that first? Or do you have a question now? No, I just have a question. Like, yeah. Uh, instead of just guessing the initial weight matrix, if you know that all of these sequences have something in common, why don't you just use one, chop it up into pieces, and use those as the initial ones? So, I mean. You know, the, the, the question is how do you come up with this initial guess, right? Uh, so this is just kind of the concept in general. In this, in this case, what we will do to come up with the initial guess is we will guess thing. We will pick random subsequences from within this set of sequences. So we don't come up with a totally random guess. Although, due to the way these things work, even if we did, it probably would be okay. Um, because... You know, then if we came up with something totally random, then the first time we ran through this, we would probably get kind of a random selection of sequences, and then we would be back to this. So we kind of save some time by by guessing from within the sequence. So yes. How do you measure the size of the matrix? Like the size? Yeah. So that's that's a a good question because essentially that needs to be. Um, fixed for for this. So you might try this with a range of different sizes. You might try this whole process, you know, for 8, 10, 12, 14, and then see which which sort of thing gets you the best score overall. And usually the transcription factor matrix sites are, do they have a specified band of lengths or it could be anything between 100 and 1, 200 displays? Well, you know, I know the the shortest example I've seen is, is essentially two, um, and the longest example is probably like you know twenty or 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 thirty. I mean, you know, one thing to remember is that you know DNA is really big. Uh, so if you look at a structure of DNA with a bound transcription factor, right? Because I often, you know, we see all these cartoons, like the cartoons I showed you before that shows, like, kind of the transcription factor interacting with the, the DNA, right? If you actually show the, the double helix, like, you'll see that, like, it can often dwarf the transcription factors around it. So there's only so much of the DNA that one transcription factor can actually, can actually bind. So you're unlikely to get really long long motifs simply because it, would, it just can't bind to that much. But the smallest I've ever seen is two, like, but that's something we don't really refer to a two, two base pair binder as a sequence specific transcription factor. You know, it's more like di dinucleotide specific, but that's, you know, it doesn't really have a lot of, uh, of uh, information there because, you know, how often are you going to see any particular dinucleotide 
a lot. Yes? So, does it mean if these ones, if you get, let's say, like one toxic, which means you need a specific antibody, like a known transition factor, yeah. then the sequence somehow will be expected to be having a common pattern and it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you the better the highest score for the condition. So, and I on any, like, yeah. So this is an approach that you could use for, um, you know, any sort. Like you could use this for chip chip seek data. The particular example I'm giving giving here, you know, we're we're just we're just and taking RNA seq data essentially. But you could use the same, and in fact, people do use the same approach for chip seek data. Now, this is something like meme, okay? and usually for chip-seq data, they'll use something called meme chip, which is kind of optimized for chip-seq data in particular ways. Right? So uh, there are a lot of things I don't have time to go into here, um, but you can say read the meme chip paper. Other information you can take advantage of if you're doing uh, chip. For one thing, you'll actually know which transcription factor is, is regulating, which you don't you don't know here. It's an unknown, unknown transcription factor. So here, so back to our example, we have randomly picked a instance from each one of these input sequences. All right, it's sequence one through five, big S one through five, and we'll call the sequence that we randomly picked little s one, little s two, little s three. All right, and here are, the, here are the actual sequences here. They don't look very similar to each other. The particular alternating approach we are going to use here is called the, the Gibbs sampler. Okay? So I describe the alternate, alternating approach in kind of broad terms. Here, we will take all of those, those small SIs, so those subsequences. We will throw away one of them. And then we'll just calculate the weight matrix um, on the ones that are left, right? So just like we calculated PWMs, PFMs to PWMs in the first place, right? And then we'll have a new motif, and we can use that motif to score all of the sequences, right? And then we will repeat this process, including the throwing out one. So you might rotate through the ones you throw out. You might pick randomly the one you're going to throw out. You might throw away a couple instead of one example. The point of that is to, to keep you from kind of getting locked into something that, that, you know, one sequence might be kind of throwing off this approach a little. It allows you to have a little bit of kind of fuzziness in something that is essentially looking for, um, is essentially looking for a local maximum. Right. So none of these alternating method is never going to get you a global maximum. It's never going to get you the single best possible motif, but it might get you something that is within a, a small uh, margin from the single best possible motif. And the more sort of noise you add during this process to allow it to kind of get off some sort of pathological uh, local minimum, uh, the better chance you have of that. So that's that's the point of that. So I'll show you how this works here. Like these are similar to these sequences that we found one second in, in this example here. Right, you find these subsequences, you calculate position frequency matrix here, you can convert to position specific squaring, just one second squaring matrix. All right. Then you can go back, you can do the sort of relative scoring thing I talked about before, much earlier on and score each one of these sequences, right? And now you find that the thing you've, you've thrown out, there's actually a good score for it here, and you add this into your set of sequences, and then you throw out the next one and go through all of this. Yes? When it says in your previous slide, when can we get an instant SI from each of the input sequences? Yeah. Do you mean to choose a different guess for each of your Sequences? Well, they're, they're different sequences, so yeah, I may mean, choose a different position if that's what you mean. But these are all different sequences, right. so yeah, there's they're they're different for for each position. Any other questions about the Gibbs Gibbs sampler? Uh, 
for how you do this. So there are other methods to do this. There's there's another method called expectation maximization or EM uh, that you may have heard in other machine learning contexts that people, you know, it's also a alternating approach. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the you know, basic idea is the same. You you guess, you see how well you're, you know, what the best possible observation that fits your model is, and then you sort of refine the model step by step. So you do all this on your sequences, and then you get a newly discovered DNA motif. Right? How do you know whether that's something people have discovered before? And there's a tool called TomTom, Tom, which is very useful for this. So TomTom Tom is kind of like a sequence aligner, like Blast or Bowtie or something. But instead of working on sequences, it works on motifs. All right, so you feed in a positional weight matrix, and you tell TomTom Tom you want to scan against Jasper or against Transfac or, or something, right? And it will take your query motif and it will give you a report describing how well it matches against every motif in the database. I mean, it won't, it won't give you a report for every motif. It will it will find the best matches and it will give you maybe the, the you know, top 20 or 30 or whatever, right? And usually it'll probably, if it does match well, it'll probably be one of the, the first few and you can interpret all of this stuff there. Right. And we won't talk about TomTom Tom more, but TomTom Tom is part of the Meme Suite uh, website. So if you have motifs and you want to solve this problem, then, then the Meme Suite website is a good place to go. All right. So that's the end of this part of the lecture about motif discovery. Any other questions on this? Okay. So let's let's move on. Uh, you know, we have so. You know, we have a discovered motif. Let's get back to the question of how do we know, you know, that a particular motif we're interested in or one of many motifs from a database is interesting for our particular set of genes. So the most often set that people will use is a set of co-regulated genes. They'll have something like a RNA-seq experiment or, or a microarray, and they're able to identify co-regulated, co-expressed genes. And the co-expression is really the observation. Co-regulation is sort of a hypothesis that you're testing. All right, so you have some set of genes that you know are co-expressed, some negative controls that don't necessarily show a co-expression pattern. All right, and you want to test against some motif. Right? Since we use computers, we can test against all of the motifs. And we have to do multiple testing testing correction, but what, what, what do we do? So, you know, we, you know, this might be an ideal model of, of um, co-regulation, right, where you have this motif, and let's say you find examples for this motif here, twice in front of this gene, twice in front of this gene, and zero times in your negative controls. Boom. Great, great hypothesis there, uh, you know, sort of validate electronically, now you should go back to the lab and and kind of you know validate experimentally what you what, what you've learned learned here. How do you actually find things like this in in practice? So there are a series of methods that are in a transcription factor binding site um, enrichment finding methods and very similar to the gene set enrichment, the go term enrichment you guys did earlier with G profiler, right? This is looking for overrepresentation, not of some go term, but of a of motifs that score well for some transcription factor. Right? So there are two two ways you can do this. So one is just like the gene ontology analysis you guys have done, you can associate each gene with whether the transcription factor binding site, whether there's a good transcription factor binding site score for a motif that you're interested in on that gene or not. Okay, so in any case, it will be either the gene will be um, will have a good TF binding site upstream or, or it won't. And you can do very similar sorts of statistical tests as you did with G-Profiler, just with this information instead of GoTerm enrichment, and look at how often do you see this in foreground versus background. It's not exactly like go term enrichment because you can also have multiple transcription factor binding sites per gene, and that can that can often be 
a really good indication that a transcription factor um, is actually biologically relevant at a particular position, even if you don't have um, extra stuff like, you know, DNA seq data or you know attack seq data telling you that some region is is actually open chromatin, you know the fact that you can find a really big cluster of, of the same uh, transcription factor binding site can be uh, really indicative that it matters in a certain place. You know, so you might find in your foreground cases it occurs a lot more often than in the background cases. Right, so these are essentially two different ways of looking for enrichment. Right, so uh, there are two different statistical tests that are used. The binomial test will look at the number of occurrences, and Fisher's exact test will look at the, the number number of genes. So if you use a tool like Opossum, uh, and you can, there I think there are links on the wiki, but you can search search for it. Certainly, Opossum is a a website in which case you can put in a set of co-expressed genes. So you just put in the symbols like. I have BRCA1 and GATA2 and CHECK2, and then it will do sequence retrieval from ensemble. It will look for regions of phylogenetic footprints, um, so regions where the, um, the gene, so the sequence is conserved between multiple species. Uh, that's the main thing opossum does, which um, you, know, you may or may not want to do. Often people are not these days. Detect transcription factor binding sites tell you how significant they are, and then, you know, maybe you have a hypothesis for transcription factor that matters. Yes? Does it publish the paper? Does it publish the paper, too? No, but, um, you know, yeah, we should we should offer Anne a, a, a workshop on doing kind of re reproducible science with, like, uh, notebooks and stuff. And <laughs> No, so Wyeth Wasserman uh, and his group developed op opossum. So, uh, so yeah, so so you know, let's look at an example of how you use opossum. And opossum is just one one tool. There are many other tools that will work kind of a similar way. We'll talk about Iregulon, which which kind of you know has some similarities here, right? So let's say we have a set of genes that we know are muscle specific and a set of genes that we ha we know are liver specific right so we feed in a bunch of gene IDs the these are not the gene IDs okay so we we fed in um, a bunch of different gene IDs and it automatically goes and finds the sequence that's upstream of, of that gene and then looks for transcription factor binding sites and says, okay, so this SRF transcription factor occurs really often upstream, right? So does MEF2 and MIB and MYTH and so on, right? Whereas these liver specific genes, you often find, say, HNF, which is actually a, a known um, hepatocellular uh, transcription factor. So it's known to be important for, for liver. So this is something that the previous opossum paper and the red arrows indicate. Uh, that they've experimentally validated that these are these are important, and you can see the different kinds of scores. Whether you do it the binomial test in terms of of um, numbers of um, numbers of genes, sorry, numbers of, of uh, occurrences, or the Fisher's test, which is the number of genes. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, <coughs> just take the left half for the muscle. Mm -hmm. Your input was twenty. Yeah. And that output, the way you read it, is that for those 23 genes, what they have in common are those four transcription factor binding sites. Well, these these 10, like you got the, the arrow, so the arrow is something that's kind of added later in the PowerPoint, because we have, you know, like if you search the literature for SRF and muscle, you're going to find a lot of stuff. That's what the arrow means. Arrow means. And no, this does not do that for you. So that part you'll have to do before you, you write your paper. So, so the top, whatever, the top five or six are significant? Uh, well, I mean, you know, you can go down as, as, as far as you want, kind of. So, so we think of these things. It's hard to kind of set a strict line for significance here. 
right? These all have, um, you know, decent, these are the p-values, right? They're all less than 0.05. Um, I don't know exactly what p-value each of these z-scores correspond to, but I assume they're all significant, right? But it's usually best to look at what's at the top of the rank, because, you know, at some point, you know, if you set any sort of decent significance threshold, the things at the bottom of the list are probably going to be less useful. So start at the top and go down. But it is telling you that the 23 genes have uh, low transcription factor binding sites in common. So it's not saying that every single one of them has, has it, but it's saying that there's a statistical enrichment. So if you actually used a possum, I think it would actually tell you how many genes have, have a good binding site. Um, but you know that again is kind of a threshold matter because um, depending on how low you set your threshold for a binding site, you can say any gene has any any binding site for things. So it all kind of combines. Yeah. yeah, but I I think you know with a lot of these genome wide analysis tools, it's a much better approach to kind of look at the things that are ranked best and kind of go down the list rather than say this is my significance cut off um, because you know you'll often find a lot of stuff that may, maybe is, meets your significance cut off but is way less important than the 20 things above it on the list. Yes, you have a question. Uh, I'm, yeah, so you can Um, so, I think, I think that the 23, um, the, no, unfortunately I can't explain that. This slide was made a long time ago. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not actually sure. It seems surprising that this would actually refer to number of genes. And I don't know whether those numbers at the top refer to the genes in your input set or in the, um, the uh, transcription factor matrices that are used, but if you want to use this, you can look at um, you can go to the Opossum Opossum website, and they have tools that you can paste in your gene list, and it'll do a lot of this stuff for you. And they will also explain things like that in their documentation. So, hold on one second. All right. Well, we are running a little, a little short on time, so I will, um, you know, so that we preserve our, our break, I will kind of skip through this next little part. Um, you guys ask a lot of questions. I, this is, you know, every every other time I've done this in the several years I've been doing this, we've finished about thirty minutes earlier. So I've been thinking I need to add add a lot of material to the uh, lecture, which apparently I, I do not. I just need better students like you guys. Um, so yeah, so there's some transcription factors that are you know basically indistinguishable for each other. For example, ETS, there are several different ETS transcription factors. They all have these you know, six or seven base pair motifs that are very similar to each other. Um, how do you find you know, if you find yourself in this problem and you're looking at ETS transcription factors or say GATA transcription factors, another good example of this, you know, there is software that you can use to prioritize this and it's called Top Gene, which I won't I won't go to any further. So let me let me go into the, the final step here, which is, you know, how do you you know how do you bring all of this together? Um, so one thing that you might want to do is, you know, as I've said it from the beginning, you know, you want to narrow down the regions of the, the genome that you want to look at instead of just saying, you know, I'm going to take every transcription start site and look 5,000 base pairs upstream and kind of pick your promoters in a really dumb way like that. You might instead want to say, where is there evidence that there is active gene regulatory uh, activity? We have all of this you know, encode data, why don't we, we use it? So my lab has developed a tool called called Segway that classifies every region of the 
genome, and we have examples for human and mouse, and you can run your, your favorite species on it as well, into different sort of gene regulatory categories. So things like transcription start site, enhancer, you know, three prime end of gene, distal regulatory element, stuff, stuff like that. So you can use evidence from things like histone modification data and, and uh, DNA hypersensitivity data and feed into the segue and it will produce a, um, an integrative um, analysis of, of all of these different data sets and give you out one answer for every base pair in the genome, which often makes things a lot easier. All right, so if you use the UCSC genome browser, you can easily load in, load in Segway. In some versions, it's built in. The instructions are at segway.hoffmanlab.org. Um, there's another interesting tool called, called GREAT. If you have a set of gene regions, let's just let's wait till the end because we're, we're going to run out of time otherwise. Um, so I'm just going to talk about these briefly, and you can look into them more later if you're interested. Um, you know, great kind of helps you solve the problem of what if you have a set of regions that you know are interesting for some reason, um, but it's not, they aren't in the promoters of genes, right? So if, the, so if you have a gene list, it's great. You can use G-Profiler or, or, or Funk Associate or, uh, you know, even David if you, if you must. Um, and, but, you know, what if it's in the middle, middle of energetic regions? So great is a tool that will solve this for energetic regions, and often it will do things by deciding, you know, that you should look at the upstream gene or the downstream gene, and they, they have some way of doing this, and it'll give you a go analysis. Um, and there are a couple of um, runs of great that are included in your, in your notes, and you can look at them there. So one thing that I keep mentioning as a problem uh, that we that we ha that we don't consider enough perhaps is that transcription factors interact with each other right often you'll find spaced transcription factor binding sites so you'll find you know transcription factor X here and then transcription factor y just downstream and there's a tool called spamo uh, so for spaced motif that you can use to analyze those those sorts of things um, if you're in that particular space there are a lot of different challenges in making better transcription factor um, binding site models. One is, as I mentioned, we have data on hundreds of transcription factors. There are, you know, more than a thousand, maybe two thousand. Like we need to get data on all of the transcription factors if we're going to have a hope of understanding all of this. I'm hopeful that is that is coming very soon. People people told me it was coming very soon, like four years ago. Uh, so I'm hoping that means that all of these different groups that told me that are going to publish a paper like this year, and then and then I will have tons of fun data to play with. But who knows? They they don't they don't tell me what's going on. Um, you know, we want to we need to understand how genetic variation affects transcription factor binding sites, right? So if you get some. Uh, you know, you, you have a patient who has some sort of cancer and some uh, distal regulatory region is affected. We want to be able to predict what sort of change in uh, the network of transcription factor binding, what, what will change in the gene regulatory network. We need a lot of work there. You know, another thing is these position weight matrices, uh, they're kind of a crude model, right? And there's a lot of information, like, you know, it assumes that each of the columns of the positional matrix are independent from each other. When in reality, they don't. It doesn't work like that, right? Like often, you're you're much more likely to have you know CT than you are to have CA, and it's not the same thing as multiplying the probability of C times the probability of A. And there are various models to consider that, um, and none have really kind of attained widespread use yet. But I think that's more likely to happen in the next two years or so. There's a lot of lot of complexity to to understand, um, and that's what a lot of us are, are working on understanding. So, if I'm to sum up here and just give you a few few take home lessons, you know, one, we have methods that do quite well at predicting transcription factor binding sites in vitro, just based on the sequence and the motif we've identified. But you always have to remember the futility conjecture, which is that sequence. And motif is never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough alone. And you need to combine it 
with other methods that will allow you to determine where real transcription factor uh, binding might occur. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about specific methods in the lab. Um, let me pause here. Who, who has questions? Maybe we should take one or one or two questions, and then, then if you're, you know, then we can kind of I can chat with you guys up here. Yes, question. Um, I have a question to you. Um, maybe this is more awkward. Could you instead of using transcription factor binding site, could you use same thing with microRNAs and then corresponding sequence? Get a better view where microRNAs can involve the universally. Yeah, uh, you you can do stuff like that. Um, you know, since most, um, I don't know how much people have used, say, position matrix models for microRNAs, if that's what you're asking about. I mean, I think people usually try something a little simpler because they assume that the microRNA is, you know, mainly going to be base, base pairing with the um, uh, other RNA, plus or minus some degree of... Uh, degeneracy but um, you know so that's an interesting area you know along other areas of, of translational control there are groups of people a, a sort of smaller community of people that is working on what some have termed the epi epi transcriptome right so trying to analyze you know all the stuff I talked about here was DNA binding proteins well there are people who study RNA binding proteins proteins. And some of those have specific motifs. And you can certainly use these same methods with RNA. You can use RIP-seq instead of CHIP-seq and so on. Uh, but um, yeah, it's an interesting area for the future. I think I'll stick to transcription myself because it's hard enough. Other, yes, question? Basically, we were discussing like co-expressed genes can have similar functions. But co-expressed genes can be because of having the similar sort of transcription factors, then they might be entirely, can have entirely different functions. Yeah, that's that's true. So, I mean, you know, you have co-expressed genes. There can be a lot of different reasons for co-expression. And just one is the transcription, you know, having the same transcription factor binding them off, but they, they might not. Um, you know, co-expressed Simple co-expression doesn't necessarily mean that there's a shared shared function. On the other hand, if you're say looking at a number of cell types, if you're say looking at more than two two uh, conditions, maybe you're looking at you know liver cells, uh, muscle cells, neural cells, immune cells, right? And you find a set of genes that are that are only expressed in the, the liver, then you have a much stronger case for some sort of liver function being in, being involved there. So I think you know a lot of these things. You know, you, you know, it's it's not like there's some level of evidence beyond which you can say this this is you know co-functional and, and this is you know these these share function and these don't. Right? It's more of an accumulation of evidence, and the you know once you get a certain amount, you say yeah, this is a really solid conclusion and other, otherwise you don't. <coughs> is there one more? Did you still have a question or did I answer it? Um, I just wanted to ask about Stepwise, but I actually looked at your website, so I think I have the answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so Segway is there. It's free. You can you can use the data sets or run it yourself. Okay, so so do not cut into your coffee break and or networking session. I will stop here.